Let's get to what is happening in the markets this morning. As we reported last week, there was a lot of turmoil because there were signs that Credit Suisse, which is a gigantic bank, was on the edge. They had put out a statement saying they were having some issues. They went to their biggest funder, which was like the Bank of Saudi Arabia or something like that. And they were like, now nah, we're good. We're not giving you any money. The market freaked out. Their stock was plummeting. It was causing all sorts of turmoil in terms of other banks around the world, including some of the ones based here. So the Swiss government, and this we reported last week, came in and said, all right, we're going to provide liquidity. Liquidity, We're basically you know, here to backstop you. And over the weekend, they were able to force through a deal for another gigantic bank, UBS, to buy Credit Suisse. Let's go ahead and put this up on the screen. From Bloomberg, the headline is they're going to buy Credit Suisse in a $3.3 billion Billion dollar deal to try to end this crisis. The government is going to backstop some of the losses. So the uh, Swiss taxpayer will be on the hook for some of this. UBS was not willing to do the deal without some provisions of that sort. And they say authorities pushed for deal amid worsening confidence crisis. So, you know, right now while we're recording this, it's 8.40 a.m. So it's still very early to see whether this is sort of like stemmed some of the chaos in the markets. There's some indications that ultimately it has. Um, but, you know, there's also a question, Sagar, of whether this banking issue was like totally separate from what happened here yeah. or if they were somewhat related. I'm not sure if we have the answer to that, really. But in one way, they might be linked, which is the type of depositors that Credit Suisse l relies on um, are similarly, you know, really large and, you know, very large deposits, potentially more flighty, just like Silicon Valley Bank. So in that way, they might be sort of related. And potentially they had some of the sim similar interest rate risk that stressed their balance sheet in the same way as Silicon Valley Bank. Yeah, it's, it's very odd because the purchase price, you know, seems low for the amount of assets that are under management. But that may give us an a insight into actually how badly run Credit Suisse clearly was. Um, this was one, you know, this is a, it's difficult also to describe it because we've had such a crazy um, couple of weeks now with the Silicon Valley bank crisis. Yeah. But this is one of the biggest reorganizations of the global financial system since 2008, from the FDIC insurance uh, mm -hmm. basically being moved to unlimited, to the Silicon Valley Bank savior, then the signature bank you know, shut down, and same with the subsequent guarantee, and now possible contagion that we are seeing in the Credit Suisse situation. So- the fact, too, that you had the Swiss government that stepped in and basically ordered UBS, the, uh, the UBS, to come in and to buy it and also to give them a credit line that other banks that were organized to make sure and keep it afloat yeah. shows you that too big to fail still not only reigns, but is now basically law of the global financial system, yeah, well, which is nuts. That's what we were supposed to prevent. And UBS with this acquisition yeah. is going to be an absolute behemoth. Yeah, right. I mean, an absolute giant now with this acquisition. Um, after the deal, Credit Suisse stock cratered 60%. Um, so that's kind of where we are. You can see the different approach that um, regulators took. I mean, in, in terms of Credit Suisse, they tried to do a bailout just for this one bank with the idea being, OK, this isn't about anybody else. This is just like sort of unique to Credit Suisse, which we talked about last week. They've had all sorts of scandals and issues anyway. So I think that makes sense in this context. You know, our regulators, and I'll get to this in a minute, they really bought into this idea that this could be this widespread crisis. And th so they needed to provide liquidity across the entire sector and give, you know, what amounts to a public bailout of all, especially mid-sized banks across the country, banks of a similar size to Silicon Valley Bank. So very different regulatory approaches here. But ultimately, you know, in both cases, taxpayers on the hook for some portion of it. Let's go ahead and put this next piece up on the screen because this was really interesting. OK, so. Part of the Fed response, as we covered last week, one part was backstopping the uh, depositors, and we'll get to more on that in a moment. The other part was opening up some of a new lending facility and allowing banks to use collateral that has seen its value collapse to use it at the original value. So to just pretend that those losses didn't actually happen. And you had a huge number of banks that took advantage of some of these crisis programs. So when I first read that, the headline here from CNBC is banks take advantage of Fed crisis lending programs. Um, when I first read this, I thought, oh, I guess there really was 
a huge problem and these banks were, you know, flocking to the discount window and to this new lending facility to make sure they have sufficient liquidity. The numbers here are quite astonishing. Uh, borrowing totaled nearly $153 billion at the Fed discount window. I believe that was a record over that um, period of time and a huge spike in terms of, you know, what had been going on there previously. But when you dig into the numbers, it tells a little bit of a different story. Let's put this tweet thread up on the screen. Um, so the, the TLDR here is that almost all of the money that was borrowed from the Fed here went to just three banks. <laughs> so most of it was out west. You can see in the first chart, um, the overwhelming preponderance of the borrowing from the Fed came from the San Francisco region and then a smaller portion from New York. And basically that's it. None of the other regions um, saw any borrowing really whatsoever. Um, and this is from a guy, his name is Nick Timirouse, maybe? Let's go with that. Timirouse, we'll just go with that. Wall Street Journal. I want to give yeah. him credit. He's yeah. with the Wall Street Journal, and this was really helpful. Um, so if you look into this, he says, assuming most of the $55 billion in New York, which was the totality of the New York lending, is for Signature Bank, which we know just failed, that would mean the balance of funds for FDIC bridge banks accounts for $88 billion for Silicon Valley Bank in San Francisco. Further, First Republic, which continues to be under pressure, said they borrowed up to $109 billion from the discount window. That suggests as much as $197 billion of the $233 billion in San Francisco went to two institutions. It also suggests there may not have been large demands from many banks across the other 10 Fed districts in the Midwest and Eastern U.S. So again, the overwhelming preponderance of this money, the bulk of this money, went to just three banks, which in my opinion kind of undermines the view that this was like a widespread immediate crisis where there were a whole bunch of banks, hundreds of banks, some people had posited across the country that really needed to shore up their balance That's sheets. That's what Nick's point was. He said, yeah. if you look at this, it's very clear who needed money and who didn't. The contagion piece, I mean, look, we will never know at the end of the day, right? Maybe it would look crazier today than it would have at that time, but clearly uh, after, and the pretext through which it was done, and then the extraordinary action was the idea that this was going to backstop the entire banking system. And in reality, that's simply not the case here in the U.S. That's just not what the Fed discount window borrowing shows us. It looks like you have troubled financial institutions, both of which who idiotically managed their bank balance sheets on top of flighty customers in the tech industry, which is specifically the most hard hit by increasing rates. And those two have basically coupled with, let's be honest, outrageous calls online for immediate bailouts unless you're going to have total collapse is what pressured Washington into doing this yeah. when, you know, it's not, look, and I, I think people may are misunderstanding. Nobody here ever said, I don't, Chris, I'm sure you didn't as well. I was like, I have never said that I don't sympathize with people who had deposits in the bank. Like I very much am looking at small businesses and others saying, yeah, that sounds like an outrageous situation. Terrible. The fact that you wouldn't be able to make payroll. I'm not saying even necessarily the normal FDIC process would have been enough because then many of these places would have been gone under. All we are saying is an extraordinary precedent has now been set. One which strikes at the bedrock of the way that we think about private banks. So if we are going to strike at that bedrock, then we should also strike at the extraordinary bonuses, profits, and multi-millions of dollars in bonuses, tax benefits, and others that these people get. That's it. That, that, that really has been the position from day one. Everybody likes the bedrock. Nobody likes whenever you want to reform how these people actually make a ton of money based on all of our assets together. I mean, it's just- Reasonable. Has, it's just become incredibly clear yeah. that- <laughs> All the profits, when times are good, the bank managers, shareholders, they are all raking in the cash. And when times are bad, guess who's on the hook? Mm -hmm. Especially when you're talking about, I mean, Silicon Valley Bank. We put some of the charts up on the screen last week. This was a weird bank. Mm -hmm. Very unique, very unusual um, in the percent of deposits that it had that were uninsured, like 98%. That is not normal, okay? That is really, really strange and unusual, that they were all concentrated in this one little cliquish club group, yep. um, you know, predominantly in the tech sector in Silicon Valley, hence the name. There were a lot of things, and then of course their decision to, they were warned by regulators, they were warned by also their own employees that were like, this risk management looks really bad. We have tons of interest rate risk here because of how our balance sheet is overwhelmingly held in these you know, long-term treasuries that are losing value by the day. They were warned about that and they thought that they could basically ride it out. So this was a whole strange confluence of unusual circumstances that would not be reflected 
in many, if any, other banks nationwide. You have Signature, which they were taking huge hit because they were, you know, had really courted a lot of people who were involved in crypto. And when crypto lost its ass, then guess what? Signature was in a really bad yep. place too. And this other bank, First Republic, that still continues to, to struggle and is losing value, stock market is, you know, stock value is falling and still struggling, et cetera. And they're the ones who are like barring like crazy at the Fed discount window. They also had a similar tech-heavy, wealthy tech-heavy clientele and a vast amount of uninsured deposits. So these are really unique, unusual circumstances. So it does not surprise me at all to look at the Fed lending and find out that, oh, it's basically these three banks and that's it. Now, there are also questions because uh, it's very clear that there was a lot of market like investor freak out last week in mm -hmm. terms of the stock market, which may continue into today. We'll find out. There's a real case to be made that because the Fed took such overwhelming industry-wide action, I mean, these investors, they are also herd creatures, that they took that as a signal. It's like, oh my goodness, there must be this massive issue across the economy. And they freaked out in terms of the markets, but all of the you know capital flight and all of these other things that were posited and that potentially there were hundreds of other banks on the brink of failure, listen, maybe, but we have not seen evidence that that is the case. And we have seen some evidence in the other direction that this was a very specific, Specific, unique set of circumstances um, that only really applied to a handful of banks in the country. I think that's really well said. Hey guys, ready or not, 2024 is fully upon us now, and Sagar and I have been brainstorming ways that we can really up our game for this critical election. Yeah, we rely on our premium subs to expand our coverage, to add staff, to upgrade the studio. We just want to give you the best independent coverage of this election, which is possible. So if you can help us out, become a premium subscriber today, breakingpoints.com, or the link is down here in the description video. It really means the world to us, and if you like what we're all about, this is the best possible way to keep us 100% independent, working only for you.